On this Monday night, coaches are role models, mentors, but should they be left alone with young athletes? No, save four women sexually abused by their ski coach. After telling their stories first to the national, tonight they're calling for change. So how else can athletes be protected? Why it could all come down to funding. Also tonight, searching for survivors of another deadly volcano eruption. As the death count rises, another explosion and piping hot ash block rescue crews. Why Fuego is even more dangerous than Hawaii's Kilauea. And the rush to develop pot products. Think marijuana martini. This is The National. The four women were just teenagers when a coach took terrible advantage of them. All former elite alpine skiers. They couldn't talk about what happened until now because of a publication ban. The ban is gone. The stories are emerging. But as Jayla Bernstein reports, so are their promises of a plan. Welcome into the lake. The once silenced victims of abuse are now speaking out, fighting through their tears. I became a young, lady, a young lady too often angry. I found it hard to smile. I lost my life as a joyful teenager. The four women were abused in the 90s by former national ski coach Bertrand Charret. Now they want to protect the next generation of athletes from the horror they endured. We decided that we would not put our kids in alpine skiing. and. Um, because what I've been through. I mean, I know how it is. I know they go away and I know it's not safe. I know it's not, not yet. This is why we're here. They're calling for new policies by the year 2020, changes that would guarantee national and provincial athletic federations of any sport would only receive government funding if they agree to three things. An independent officer who would handle incidents and complaints, mandatory training for coaches and volunteers, and a set of rules and procedures to protect athletes, including the so-called rule of two. It means that uh, young people are never alone with a coach or otherwise official for any extended duration, whether it be in travel or in social environments. Having two people present is the significant protection factor that we need to reduce uh, abuse. Uh. Alpine Canada says it's sorry for not doing more to support the victims. It agrees with the policy changes. It could have happened to me, to my kids, to anyone else's children. We I mean, we need to stop this. This is, is horrific and we don't want anyone to suffer like these women have suffered. Bertrand Charret continues to deny all accusations. He's appealing some of last June's 37 convictions on sex-related charges. In the meantime... And we hope that things will change. These women say their healing process is finally moving ahead. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. And we should point out that it's not just Charest's victims who are calling for action on all of this. Today in question period, Sport Minister Christy Duncan was asked about how the government plans to protect vulnerable athletes from sexual predators. Her response was firm. It could affect funding. All Canadians deserve the opportunity to participate in a sport environment that is free from discrimination, harassment or abuse. We have established a working group on gender equity and in sport, which will examine a number of issues, including harassment, discrimination and abuse in sport. All federally funded sport organizations must have anti-discrimination, harassment and abuse policy in place to be eligible in funding. We will be announcing changes to strengthen our policy in the coming weeks. Now, when the four women shared their stories with us first last night, there was an overriding theme that even though as teens they were too scared to talk openly about the sexual abuse they endured, there were adults in their midst who seemed to know what was going on and didn't act. In my experience, there was an adult that was aware. And instead of speaking up and do the right thing, they, he protected the coach. CBC News has been told of conversations suggesting at the time that a coach having sex with athletes was known. My sense was it was almost like, you know, oh my God, there's, you know, girls sleeping with their coach at the same time as opposed to, oh my God, this guy did something terrible. At some point when it was too much, at least one athlete, Gail Kelly, went to Alpine Canada. You know what? 
they make me feel like it was my fault. How did they do that? They tried to hide everything from everybody and... Years later, Alpine Canada apologized to the women, but it still rings hollow to them. And it's the culture of sport they're worried about now. So the relationship that you have with your coach is a very unique one, and it's very... Um, it's sensitive, and your coach tells you to, to, to work on something or to try this. You believe him, you trust him, you're so hungry for success. This is about power. They had none then. They were relying on adults to protect them. And now, all these years later, they have some power back, and they'll keep using it for the sake of keeping the next generation of athletes safe. Here's what's coming up on tonight's National. The U.S. president says he has the absolute right to pardon himself in the Russia inquiry. What to expect in a looming showdown. And the showdown looming in Ontario. Looks like there's going to be a change in government. So what's the real cost of the front runners' platforms? But first, the deadly volcano raining ash and debris over Guatemala. More than 60 people are dead and nearly 2 million affected in the disaster, or about a tenth of the country's entire population. Known as the Volcano of Fire, Fuego has been erupting since Sunday, spewing ash, rock and gas into local villages. Rene Filipponi followed this breaking story for us last night and has more now on today's search efforts that have become increasingly desperate. <laughs> The search for the missing turned to mourning for many today as rescuers pulled dozens of bodies from the ash. Many more remain unaccounted for, buried by the biggest explosion Volcan de Fuego has seen in four decades. This woman says she managed to escape the lava. She found two of her children alive, but two daughters, a son and grandchild, are still missing. The search has been a challenge, the ground charred by scorching volcanic debris. This first responder says the ash is still extremely hot, making it difficult for rescuers to work and hampering the speed of the search. The eruption sent a thick plume of smoke and ash kilometers into the sky. In more dangerously pyroclastic flows, a deadly mix of hot gas and volcanic matter that sped down the mountain, destroying anything in its path. <laughs> Residents say they were caught unaware. There was no warning from officials until it was too late. Fuego is one of Central America's most active volcanoes. This is video of an eruption earlier this year. It was common, and that's part of the reason no one knew how bad this would get. Fuego has been active now for quite a few uh, weeks, in fact. It's been building up its activity, but they wane. They, they go through big pulses and they quiet down, they build up again. It's impossible to predict a volcanic eruption, and even forecasting them is very, very difficult. And today, the volcano continued to pulse. Another eruption had residents running and halted the rescue effort. For now, this firefighter says the objective is to look for survivors as well as bodies. With an unknown number of people still missing, the death toll is sure to rise. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, with this volcano erupting so soon after Hawaii's eruption, you may be wondering if the two are linked in some way. They're not. And when you zero in on the volcanoes themselves, you can see why the outcomes have been so drastically different. Fuego is a stratovolcano, meaning it's shaped like a cone, skinny on top, which is why you get these explosive eruptions. The magma inside is also thick and sticky, almost acts like a plug, trapping gases in until it blows violently. Hawaii's Kilauea, on the other hand, is a shield volcano with long, gentle slopes and fluid lava that makes its way out through fissures and vents. It's a slower eruption, and the big, explosive kind is pretty rare. And there's one other important difference. Fuego is right on the ring of fire. That's where you'll find some of the world's most explosive volcanoes. Kilauea is miles away and not technically part of that same chain. All right, I'm moving closer to home now. Uh, Rosemary, Ontario election just three days away, and you'll be right here taking us through the results.
Yeah, I sure will, Andrew. There's so much that is still down to the wire, but the polls seem to suggest that Ontario will have a new government. Liberal Kathleen Wynne has already conceded certain defeat, leaving the Progressive Conservatives and the New Democrats to battle it out. Now, many voters are looking a little more closely at what both parties have to offer, and so is the CBC's Ron Charles. Thanks. Good luck. Good luck to all of us, right? Good luck to all of us. Ontario NDP leader Andrea Horvath began this last week of the campaign in southwestern Ontario. Horvath has been targeting her main rival for power, Ontario PC leader Doug Ford. Mr. Ford's going to give big tax cuts to the rich, uh, big tax cuts to wealthy corporations, and everyday families like the ones here in Sarnia are going to get an $18 break. Ford has been shooting back. The NDP have a $7 billion hole in their plan. They continue to push the same radical ideology that crippled Ontario under the Bob Ray government. Liberal leader Kathleen Wynne's March budget forecast annual deficits of at least $6 billion for the next five years. Most economists say that even with the Liberals out, Thursday's election won't significantly change that. The NDP is quite upfront that they're not particularly concerned about the deficit. The Conservatives at least started out, they're quite concerned about the deficit. At one point said they were going to balance it by the end of the mandate. That's now gone until we'll balance it over a reasonable period of time. But that's the talk. The actual actions that are proposed, nobody seems to care about the deficit. The NDP has forecast deficits slightly lower than the Liberal budgets. The Conservatives have provided no indication of how much their deficits will run, just a 28-page list of promises. They actually may have a plan that yields even larger deficits than that because they've got a lot of spending, uh, actually more items listed in the 28 pages than I'd appreciated listening to the various different speeches, and they got some major tax reduction proposals as well. He says no matter which of the parties wins on Thursday, their platform will have been built on borrowed money. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, so here's where things stand on the CBC poll tracker. Since the last week of May, the NDP and PCs have been really in a dead heat, and they remain virtually tied as of tonight. The Liberals are well back. The PCs, though, are favoured to win more seats than the NDP. With just a couple of days left in the campaign, a new issue for the Ford team, and it comes from inside the Ford family itself. His late brother Rob Ford's widow and children have sued Doug Ford for $16.5 million. They allege Doug has deprived them of millions of dollars, including shares in the family company even a life insurance policy. In the suit filed on Friday, Renata Ford also accuses Doug of being negligent in managing the family company called Deco Labels. She claims Doug Ford's financial decisions have led to a steady drop in its value. Ford has denied the claims made in the lawsuit, and in a statement, he said this. Renata's lawyers have been clear to us throughout this campaign that either we hand over money or they will go public with these false claims, and that is exactly what they have done with three days to go until the election. To Washington now, where a series of early morning tweets once again set the agenda, leading to a flurry of debate and question after question at the White House briefing about whether Donald Trump considers himself above the law. As Paul Hunter tells us, Trump surrogate spent the day talking hypothetical presidential crimes and pardons thanks to the boss himself. On this, the 500th day of Donald Trump's presidency, he tweeted, 500 days of American greatness. But that's not the tweet the country's talking about. It's this one. I have the absolute right to pardon myself, he wrote this morning. A reference to special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into whether Trump's campaign colluded with Russia to meddle in the 2016 election and whether Trump himself obstructed justice. Asked about the self-protecting tweet, said Trump's press secretary today. Uh, thankfully, the president hasn't done anything wrong and wouldn't have any need for a pardon. Well, I'm not a crook. Famously, Richard Nixon was pardoned, but by proxy. After Nixon quit, his successor did the deed. And by these presents do grant a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon. But no president has ever pardoned himself. 
And though Trump currently faces no charges, his lawyer underlined this weekend that as president, he probably has the power to do it. But it's politically untenable, so he won't. Pardoning himself would just be unthinkable. And it would, it would, it would lead to probably an immediate impeachment. Rudy Giuliani added in an interview with the Huffington Post, a sitting president can't be indicted anyway for any crime, even murder. He'd first have to be impeached. On her way to the West Wing this morning, reporters pressed Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway. Why does the president think he's above the law, Kellyanne? Excuse me? Why does the president think he's above the law? Well, why would he need to pardon himself when he's done nothing wrong? But he said he could just like to engage in these hypothetical exercises constantly. That same question, is he above the law, was put to Sarah Sanders today as well. No, he's not, she said. No one is. And then she moved on. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. For a system famous for its checks and balances, the U.S. presidential pardon is surprisingly unfettered. In most cases, the only thing restricting a president is the fear of political blowback. At the end of his presidency, Bill Clinton pardoned financier Mark Rich, who had been convicted of massive tax fraud. You're not saying these people didn't commit the offense. You're saying they paid. Rich's wife was a donor for the Clintons, including Hillary's Senate bid. Fun fact, Trump's current lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, was no fan of that presidential pardon. I think what the president did is an absolute outrage. Fun fact, too, a U.S. attorney by the name of James Comey oversaw an FBI investigation of that pardon, which wrapped up in 2005 without finding wrongdoing. Not only can a president pardon someone already convicted, a president can issue a pardon before the charges are even filed. That was the case when Ford pardoned Nixon. I do have the right as president of the United States to make that decision. Just the hint that Trump is willing to use his pardon powers could reduce leverage for investigators trying to get associates to testify against him. Would you consider a pardon for Michael Flynn? I don't want to talk about pardons for Michael Flynn yet. We'll see what happens. And in even considering a pardon, Trump could have legal grounds to ask for relevant documents such as grand jury testimony, potentially giving his team a window into Mueller's investigation. So could Trump pardon himself? Despite what Trump tweeted, it's uncharted territory. A Justice Department opinion from 1974 suggests he can't, but could still declare himself temporarily unfit for office and then get the vice president to do it for him. As a concept, legally dicey, politically risky, and apparently on Trump's mind. And lots more on tap for tonight's National, including the liver disease you may have and not even know it, what doctors are saying about getting tested. Plus, more than a century after his birth, a legendary First Nations runner steps into a Google honor. And potions, lotions, and snappy cocktails. What's ahead in products infused with cannabis? So if I could have a beverage that actually makes me a bit giddy and doesn't give me any calories, I'm feeling pretty good about that choice of a beverage. Tonight on The National, dozens of people are hurt, some with life-threatening injuries, after a bus carrying Chinese tourists crashed in eastern Ontario. It happened this afternoon on Highway 401 near Prescott, about an hour south of Ottawa. The bus was heading west when it veered off the highway and smashed into a wall of rock. Of the 37 people on board, police say four were hurt critically, another 20 had more minor injuries. An investigation into the cause of the crash is now underway. New details tonight about a WestJet flight that came dangerously close to the ocean's surface last year while trying to land in St. Martin. An investigation by the Transportation Safety Board has found that the plane came within just 12 meters of the water before an alarm went off and the pilots realized they were off course. Unexpected bad weather was partly to blame, according to the TSB, because that made it harder to see. The crew did manage to land the plane safely on their second attempt. 
And after days of emotional victim tributes, the inquiry into last year's devastating Grenfell Tower fire shifted today to hearing from experts on what went wrong. One key criticism zeroed in on the fact that the London Fire Brigade told residents calling for help to stay put in their apartments. It wasn't until nearly two hours after the first emergency call that people were finally advised to get out. 72 people died. Hepatitis C can destroy a person's liver, but it hides, often working so slowly it isn't noticed until the damage is severe. Canadian liver specialists have issued a new recommendation that nearly all Canadian baby boomers and Gen Xers get tested. But as Christine Barak explains, the medical field is divided on the scale of the problem and also this proposed solution. The first clue came from blood work during a routine physical. Good. More testing and a specialist confirmed it. Sherry Hughes had hepatitis C. And I went, oh my God, how did that happen? Like, no idea. Hughes had early stage liver damage. She still doesn't know how she contracted the bloodborne virus. Decades ago, there wasn't widespread screening of blood products for infections like Hep C. The virus can also be spread through infected needles. Liver specialists are now recommending all Canadians born between 1945 and 75 be tested for Hep C because there are new drugs to treat it. The government has removed all restrictions for getting access to these treatments. So every infected person with hepatitis C in Canada can access therapy. The doctors that put out this latest guideline say they do have relationships to the manufacturers of hepatitis C drugs, broadly speaking, but say that didn't influence their recommendation. They also acknowledge there's another task force that doesn't agree with them. A guideline published a year ago largely for family doctors recommended the opposite, finding no evidence on the effectiveness of screening unless the patient was showing symptoms or at high risk of contracting hep C, saying it made sense for injection drug users and sex workers, but not everyone. We really do not know whether these drugs are a cure. The costs of screening and treatment would have a dramatic impact on our health care budget you know, of the order of $1.5 billion. That leaves patients and physicians between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> Family physician Danielle Martin agrees high-risk patients need to be tested. As for everyone else... We're going to have to have those conversations one by one in our offices. And no doubt some patients may have questions of their own. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on tonight's National, the Indigenous runner still winning more than a century after his birth. But first, Puerto Rico, almost nine months later, an island still scarred by Hurricane Maria. We are, we are tired. Uh, we don't sleep well, we uh, get worry every day, and uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. and the San Juan that we knew yesterday is no longer there. So we have to reconstruct, rebuild, reinvent it. We have to be resilient and we have to push on. Friday marked the official start of the new Atlantic hurricane season, but Puerto Rico is still reeling from the last one. When Hurricane Maria devastated the island, wiping out the power grid and leaving the entire territory in the dark. While most services have since been restored, more than 11,000 people are still without power eight months after the storm hit. Many are resorting to repairing power lines themselves, saying the government abandoned them as they brace for a busy start to this hurricane season. Tonight, we are revisiting the national documentary we brought you last November when Joanna Romiliotis went there and talked with Puerto Ricans who are looking for light. We arrive to a blackened capital, to a sound that slices through the dark, through the drone of generators. It's the croaking of the coqui, tiny frogs native to Puerto Rico. Their symphony accompanies the weariness. We find Naya Reese and her family on the side of a busy road. The headlights of passing cars are like beacons. They've been without power for weeks. So who lives here with you? 
my mom, my dad, my brother, my two cousins, my grandma, and my uncle. It's and been family. hard. hard and, yeah, without any electricity, the mosquitoes, the heat. We know, I know that there are places have been more affected by the Hurricane Maria, but we're also part of Puerto Rico and we need help. Bags of ice keep their food cool. Like most people here, they can't afford a generator or the fuel to run it. They just keep looking for light wherever they can find it. Two months after Hurricane Maria tore through the island, Puerto Rico is still clawing its way out of the dark. It's hard to believe this is two months later. Doesn't look like much has been done here. Outside of San Juan, it gets worse. Look at this, it's all falling apart. Just like hanging. We head to the mountains. There's a quiet to the landscape, the kind that sets in after too much waiting. Entire towns here have no power. Homes are leveled. It's hard to see the ruins below until you do. We meet Edwin Colon near the town of Albonito. He shows us what's left of his house with the eagerness of someone who feels forgotten. The kitchen, and this was their bathroom. The cabana no sea mucho que se había comprado. El gavetero y eso no sea mucho, como un mes o dos que se había comprado esto. Es duro. He is anxious all the time now, he says. Feels abandoned. Apenado y olvidado. Lives do seem stalled, brutally interrupted. Look inside, at the clothes still hanging. The hurricane destroyed nearly 500,000 homes and decimated a power grid already weakened by years of neglect. Critical infrastructure, too, is crippled. Yep, look at that. You see the bridge over there? Do you think it's safe for me to... Yeah, yeah, just... If there is a way out, no one can point to it. We're on our way to Barranquita, which is one of the most hard-hit areas in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And as you can see, we had to stop and get out of our vehicle because the main bridge that takes us through the town has collapsed. It's a main artery, and we learn crews only started repairs that day, six weeks after Hurricane Maria. They can't keep up. We take a detour. Oh, okay. Over there. We'll just follow them and see where they're going. Okay. Yeah. So it looks like this is where the bridge was. Yeah. Find another collapsed bridge and another story. When the night is when it's the night, cuando cae la noche, más difícil. Esto es bien oscuro. No se ve nada. Porque es peligroso. Jacqueline Sierra has no electricity and no running water. She uses bottled water to do laundry. The slow trickle of aid hasn't reached her, and it's been two months. Well, the human being adapts, right? To different forms of living, but it's not easy. It's not easy. Do you feel like they forgot you, or? Yeah. Yeah. Sí. Where is FEMA? Where is FEMA? Buena pregunta. Good question? I don't know. In fact, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, is here and leading the recovery effort. As an American territory, Puerto Rico is entitled to its help. But delivering that help is complicated. Roads are washed out. Cell service is spotty. So trucks blare the message and tell people where to go find that help.
It took FEMA a month to set up this aid center just outside the town of Barranquitas. Only now are people registering for the basics. Most are just asking for a tarp to serve as a temporary roof. Elsa Avida says, without one, life is all about bracing for the next rainfall. FEMA plans to airlift people who have no homes left to repair to join the tens of thousands of Puerto Ricans who've already fled to mainland USA. But so many are stuck here, their lives suspended in shelters like this one. In the hour we spend here, Annabel Colon barely moves. Si la casa mía no está habitable por el techo y por el piso, porque el piso de, se desniveló, pues entonces prestarnos una, una, una casa donde nosotros podamos estar unos meses hasta que arreglen la casa donde uno vive. What's the worst part of waiting? The desperation isn't raw anymore. It's resigned, exhausted. Luisito Hernandez doesn't even sit up to talk. I wake up. I feel nervous. Just, you know what I mean? I get nervous because I say, what am I doing here? You know what I mean? That's not easy for me. Not easy for these people. When we get further into town, Hola. we find most oh, of the water good. has drained away too. All the ground is water. Yes. A man shows us how bad it was. That's his house right there. All the brown is water. One of the town's schools only opened the day we came here. Angelica Caenz holds on to that. It's difficult. Muchos de los de la comunidad perdieron el trabajo por la electricidad, porque no hay servicios, los servicios esenciales. En sé sí hay días que se levanta uno y es desesperante, pero tenemos que seguir. No nos cuesta o de otra. No hay, no hay, no hay alternativa. We head back on a road littered with broken lives. And then, as we near San Juan, this. A severe thunderstorm. Go, 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 go. In less than 10 minutes, the highways are flooded. Our cameraman struggles to get us through it. The downpour ends as suddenly as it started. The city's water pumps still don't work properly. We stop on higher ground. It was complete. And find Maria Cecilia Uribe and her husband Julio. If you want to go inside, get a... Look, everything is with water. We just have been taking out all the water, but if you see, there is still water. Three times. Your house has flooded three times? Yeah. They don't, they don't do nothing. What do you think of the, of the recovery so far in terms of what the government's been able to do? I don't think they have been doing... I, have, I think they have been doing a lot of things. But they have missing a lot of things. We are fortunate because we have. You have a generator. Yes. We put on in the night and we put off in the in the morning. We are we are tired. 
uh, we don't sleep well, we uh, get worry every day, and uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. 45 days uh, without uh, electricity is just uh, uh, unthink unthinkable. Uh, but, uh, not even a third world, uh, and uh, we were not. <laughs> now we are. Looking for light, there seems to be no end to the wait. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Puerto Rico. Just ahead on tonight's National, here come the ganjapreneurs, the rush to produce cannabis-infused products. It's wonderful. Every kind of product you can imagine, uh, all the new innovations that are coming out in the industry, it's beautiful. In just a matter of days, the bill to legalize recreational marijuana heads to a crucial final vote in the Senate. And if it passes, Canadians will be able to light up legally later this year. But what about people who don't want to smoke pot? There are lots of ways to consume the drug, after all. And even though things like edibles and oils won't be legal for at least another year, our Diane Buckner found some eager entrepreneurs already hard at work. Canada's largest cannabis trade show. So this machine right here rolls 100 joints in two minutes. Scores of vendors are here showing off their best stuff. So we've got some hemp water, some hemp sparkling water, and we also have some hemp energy shots. Flax papers, wood papers, rice papers, hemp papers, and it's pretty good. It's wonderful. Every kind of product you can imagine, uh, all the new innovations that are coming out in the industry, it's beautiful. And each spray is 2.5 milligrams under the tongue, so it's a microdose for shake and spray and smile. There are already countless products on the market, but there are many, many more coming, aimed at people who don't want to smoke a joint, but would like to get high somehow. In Smith's Falls, just outside of Ottawa, this is Canopy Growth, one of the biggest medicinal cannabis producers in the world. In a former Hershey's chocolate factory, they're growing thousands of kilos of marijuana, much of it to be ready when recreational use becomes legal. But there's a lot more going on here than just buds in bags. And what we're trying to do here is take that basic ingredient and convert it into whatever it could be. CEO Bruce Linton leads us through the firm's research laboratory, where scientists are working on new innovations, including cannabis beverages that Linton believes could compete with alcohol. You want to modify your mood. You want to be in a bit more of an upbeat. You want to be more social. That's the same reason for alcohol. Linton points out what he believes is a big selling point. Cannabis has no calories. So if I could have a beverage that actually makes me a bit giddy and doesn't give me any calories, I'm feeling pretty good about that choice of a beverage. Yeah, well, what we've done is we've spent a lot of time re-engineering um, the e-cigarette um, hardware. In downtown Toronto, Dustin Koffler has another option for casual cannabis connoisseurs. There's different viscosities, there's also different um, types of strains, which means that there has to be different types of hardware to accommodate these types of extracts. He's designed a line of vaporizers, custom made for cannabis oil. His grandfather, Murray Koffler, was the founder of Shoppers Drug Mart. Just before he passed away this year, we told him what we were doing and he was extremely proud and, you know, we, make, we joked around saying that we're all in the drug industry, just on different sides of the spectrum. He's already selling the devices to over 60 licensed producers in the U.S., Israel, Mexico and Uruguay. But the reality is any entrepreneur in this space is gambling to some extent. The date for legalization in Canada is still hazy. Instead of July 1st, now many say it could be August or even September. Okay, go, go down. This consultant acknowledges the risk. 
We've estimated the base market and we multiply the number of adult consumers by the estimated consumption and the estimated price per gram, which leads you to about $4.9 to $8.7 billion. That's your base. But her firm has tallied up the money to be made by those with creative new products. The upside for the ancillary market is about $12.7 to $22.6 billion. This is a huge number. Wow. As, the, as the infused products become more uh, mainstream, you're starting to see a larger market opportunity, which is why you're seeing the innovation and the entrepreneurship in all of those edible type of categories. That demand is what they're banking on here in Belleville, Ontario. We're experimenting with all types of beers, but we're, we're, we're pretty partial to the Imperial Pilsners being the most likely that we'll lead off with in the marketplace. Duma Winshu heads up Province Brands, which is developing what it says is the world's first beer brewed from cannabis. The recipe swaps out barley for marijuana. People don't want to step outside to smoke. You know, nobody wants to learn how to roll a joint. You spill stuff all over the place. And you end up smelling terrible. Uh, you don't want to have to learn how to use a vaporizer pen. They have buttons. It's super complicated. It's sticky. Gets in your pocket. And if, if I were to meet you after work, you know, uh, uh, to talk about business, it would be really awkward if I was like, hey, let's meet at the bar and share a plate of gummy bears. Or nobody does that, you know? That may also explain why one of the world's biggest alcohol companies, Constellation Brands, has invested $245 million in canopy growth. Cannabis is expected to steal as much as 20% of the alcohol market. No wonder entrepreneurs and investors are piling into the market. Prohibition's a wonderful thing. We got 95 years of pent-up potential. Imagine how disruptive it is now that that goes boom. It's wide open. With so many different products being developed, experts say not all of them will survive. But the race is on, and the enthusiasm, at least, is already intoxicating. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, if you're tempted to run off and Google any of those products now, you'll see that today's Google Doodle has a running theme, and it's inspired by a legendary First Nations athlete. This tireless marathon man, it's an animated homage to Tom Longboat. He was born on this day in 1887, one of the greatest athletes in Canadian history. An Onondaga runner from Ontario's Six Nations Reserve, Longboat shattered records and stereotypes. Longboat started running in his teens after fleeing a residential school to live with his uncle. He easily won his first Boston Marathon in 1907, destroying the previous record by five minutes in a snowstorm, no less. After turning pro, he won race after race, becoming one of the most famous and respected Indigenous people of his day. His greatest rival, British runner Alfred Shrub, called him one of the greatest, if not the greatest, marathoner of all time. He was even even a hero of the First World War. Today, we visited the school in Toronto that bears his name as kids celebrated Tom Longboat Day. Tom Longboat was famous, and it, the school just represents him in, to keep him like going through generations. In relay, I had to like experience what he like, how he ran, and how, like how did he do it? I learned that he was like a messenger during World War One. And he, his family's kind of like complicated where he, when he went to World War I, his wife thought he might have died. So he, she married someone else, so he got a new wife when he came back. It all worked out in the end. Longboat settled in Toronto after the war until he retired to the Six Nations Reserve in 1944. His legacy secured. Tonight on The National, some developing news on President Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort. U.S. federal prosecutors say he tried to tamper with witnesses in his case, and they now want a judge to either revise or revoke an order that released him ahead of his trial. Revoking the order would send him to jail. The request comes from prosecutors working for Robert Mueller, the special counsel investigating possible collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. Manafort faces a number of allegations, including money laundering and conspiracy. He's pleaded not guilty. 
A big win today for the Christian baker who refused to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled in his favor. But the victory for Jack Phillips was narrow. In its decision, the Supreme Court said it did believe his views needed protection, but what the court did not do was establish a broader rule, spelling out on exactly what grounds a business can refuse to serve someone for religious reasons. And the U.S. president has canceled a planned visit by this year's Super Bowl champions to the White House. There was supposed to be a celebration for the Philadelphia Eagles tomorrow, but in a statement, Donald Trump said he's uninvited the whole team because some of them disagreed with his call for players to stand during the national anthem at NFL games. And though the Eagles did want to send a smaller delegation, Trump decided it should be all or nothing. I started the show talking about marijuana martinis. Now I'm going to talk about Singapore slings and something called the Trump and the Kim. Well, those are two new drinks making their debut in Singapore ahead of the most uh, much anticipated summit between Donald Trump and Kim Jong Un. And the cocktail diplomacy <laughs> is our moment of the day. It being one of the biggest event in uh, recent world history. We wanted to get involved with the whole uh, hype and fun that's happening at the moment. For the base, I'm using bourbon. Okay, why I'm using bourbon? Because bourbon is came from Kentucky. The mixture is uh, berries and a soju. Of course, of course, soju needs to be in drink of Koreans. Customers who come usually order both of it, uh, just to try both of it, and uh, they actually go for the second round, so it's doing very well. So uh, the drinks, so because everything has to be fair, have equal parts alcohol in each drink. But I would point out that Kentucky bourbon now has all sorts of tariffs on it, so I don't know how they're getting it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have a feeling neither one of those men are going to be trying either of these drinks. We know uh, Donald Trump doesn't drink. His mm -hmm. brother w was an alcoholic. He says he's never had a drink. And Kim Jong-un apparently is a beer man. Um, I see there, that. Yeah, there's craft beer being brewed in North Korea because he doesn't like that tasteless South Korean stuff. <laughs> you know, I, I got to say, my first reaction to this story was, you got to be kidding me. Really? This is happening? But, but then the more I thought about it, the more it seems oddly appropriate, given how the whole summit, the whole spectacle has unfolded on the world stage. You know what? It feels just about right. Okay, <laughs> that's The National for this Monday, June 4th. Good night. Good night. Night.